chapter one of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter one we're on the rocks this time leah smashin for all we're worth how we can win clear beats me with hands which had never earned a shilling thrust into pockets empty even of that coin jim came stretched out his long legs and surveyed his neat boots as he made this cryptic speech his habit of expressing himself in a parabolic fashion was confusing to his friends but five years of marital squabbling had schooled his wife into ready comprehension and she usually responded without comment on this occasion however the subject under discussion irritated even her healthy nerves and she replied irrelevantly really jim i wish you would talk english huh never knew i was talking choctaw you might be for all the sense an ordinary person can make of it ah said jim with the clumsy affection of a bear but you're not an ordinary person leah i'm the common or garden ass that can't straighten things now you can for want of a husband i suppose i must come now leah am i not your husband oh yes she answered with a flick of her handkerchief across a pair of scornful lips my husband not a husband what's the difference as if i could waste time in explaining we have more serious matters to talk about than your want of brains serious enough assented the man sulkily but you know how to deal with trouble leah i ought to retorted his wife with a shrug considering the experience i have had since marrying you i wish i hadn't so do i confess jim then mended his speech with a dim sense of having overstepped the mark no by jupiter i don't mean that you and i get on very well considerin each swings on a private hook you are not a bad sort leah and i'm a a a well you know what i am not a diplomatist certainly isn't this praise a trifle obvious you don't mean it do you she looked at him wistfully but her candid husband soon stopped any sentimental illusions she may have momentarily entertained oh yes i mean it in a sort of way and good temper on both sides will help us to push through the business quicker you mean the bankruptcy court snapped his wife perhaps i mean the divorce court was his tart reply but she was quite ready with an answer on your own part then you can't say a word against me who said i could you've got the one virtue that gives its name to the rest and think yourself an angel i had your assurance that i was an angel once no doubt it's the sort of thing a man has to say to the woman he is engaged to and never says to the woman he is married to marriage isn't all honey leah and heavens lady jim addressed the ceiling as if i required telling but compared with other women jim i am not i never said you were interrupted kames crossly i'd screw your neck if you went on like other women upon my word jim i would admire you more if you did attempt something of that sort sorry i can't oblige you but i'm a gentleman and bear an honoured name an honoured name sneerin won't alter facts leah the name of kames has always been honoured till you dragged it through the mud interrupted leah in her turn the old duke is all right and frith's a kind man if somewhat dull but you oh heavens to think that such a saul should be amongst the prophets jim not understanding the scriptural allusion thought he was being chaffed a liberty which his bovine pride resented by two minutes of sulky silence 
moreover he dreaded his wife's formidable tongue the lash of which could cut through even his tough hide how are we going to get through the business at this rate was his next contribution to the conversation you don't remember that i've to meet a fellow at the club to see about a bet and i haven't got a shillin to rattle against another declared jim pathetically well was the sharp reply i have to shop this afternoon with but one miserable sovereign in my purse lord jim opened his sleepy blue eyes i say you couldn't no said his wife decisively i couldn't and i wouldn't and i can't and i shan't perhaps you'll read the paper and let me think all right said kames reaching for the sporting times i want to see the bettin on podaskus betting will be your ruin has been corrected jim chuckling then reverted to his early metaphor we're on the rocks this time leah and no mistake his wife cast a look of scorn on the pink and white face she had once thought handsome and indeed kames was good-looking in a heavy saxon way tall and muscular with the strength of a bull and the manners of a bear he was precisely the sort of brutal athlete to attract women they flocked round him like bees and gave him more honey than was good for him he accepted their endearments with the complacent vanity of an egotist and took little trouble to please even the prettiest whereupon he was adored the more leah with her elbows on the breakfast-table stared at jim's well-brushed head bending over the pink sheets and asked herself for the hundredth time why she had married him physically he resembled a splendid hercules but in another sense the likeness was not a speaking one he satisfied her eyes and in no other way gave her pleasure when he talked he babbled vainly about himself and his doings to the exclusion of any topic likely to interest other people possessed of that easy good nature which refuses nothing which costs nothing jim kames was looked upon as a good fellow a title which covers a multitude of the minor sins jim would have been meritorious as a caveman and prehistorically perfect as a civilized being he left very much to be desired the subject was neither agreeable nor inexhaustible and leah rose with a shrug of her shapely shoulders jim looked up well he asked encouragingly nothing said his wife curtly and moved to the window here she leaned against the sash and looked at the narrow grey street which was such a good address to impress tradesmen and so expensive to live in not that the question of rent troubled the pair they paid none and would have been as much insulted if visited on quarter-day as an irish tenant the duke of pentland at the time of their marriage had presented them with the furnished ten curzon street but hampered with certain restrictions they could not sell it or even mortgage it nor could money be raised on the furniture the duke paid all rates and taxes and saw to all repairs beyond dwelling in this very desirable residence and calling it publicly their home lord and lady jim had no interest in it whatsoever both thought it was ridiculous that they could not turn the curzon street house into money when they needed ready cash so badly and life was so hard to people of their standing and tastes leah came of a bankrupt family and had brought nothing to jim but her own clever beautiful self she considered the two thousand a year which the duke allowed his second son opulence until she learned what delightful things money could buy then jim used a large amount of the quarterly payments on his own account and tradesmen would not give her the delightful things without money she certainly had bills in nearly every shop in bond street and out of it but even bills had to be paid in the long run the post brought a good many and brought also lawyers letters not pleasant to read between them this happy pair had mortgaged their income and the money they had obtained was all gone now they had no income and many bills what was to be done this problem jim had set leah to solve but clever as she knew herself to be the solution was beyond her 
can't you borrow jim she asked turning gloomily from the window perhaps a fiver was the prompt response every one's as mean as mean i've tried em all and you leah shook her head twenty pounds for all my asking there's your godmother old lady canvey suggested jim she's as rich as dives and like dives won't give a penny to this lazarus she smiles and talks epigrams and preaches but as to helping leah shrugged her shoulders again the action drew her husband's attention to a very magnificent figure which was loudly admired jim had admired it himself before he had got used to seeing it in the breakfast-room now it struck him that this attraction might be turned into money you're a ripping woman in the way of looks he said throwing down the newspaper if you went on the stage eh as the fairy queen inquired his wife scornfully that's about all i'm suited for i know the things i can't do jim and acting is one besides think of what the duke would say jim yawned and lighted a cigarette he can't say more than he has said he remarked lazily sides i never go to hear him preach now no you send me why not the duke loves a pretty woman you can twist him round your little finger i can't twist any money out of him said lady jim irritably more's the pity we're on the rocks you've said that twice already and i'll say it again and again and again snapped jim you don't seem to realize the hole we're in don't i she queried with an emotion she would never have shown in society i realize that i have one sovereign and you only a fiver i intend to borrow from a sure man said jim but i say what's to be done we must go through the court what's the use of that it'll only settle our debts we want ready money i don't care a straw about the tradesmen can't we let this house no the duke says we can live in it as long as we like but if we leave he'll take it back again it's like giving a boy half a crown and telling him not to spend it said kames looking round if we only could it's a jolly sort of room this and we'd get a good rent for the house the room was indeed pretty being decorated in a pompadour manner its walls were adorned with white paper sprinkled with bunches of roses tied with fluttering blue ribbons and the carpet bore the same dainty design the furniture was of white wood upholstered in brocade also diversified with roses and azure streamers there were many delicate water-colour pictures a grate and fire-irons of polished brass and electric lights in rose-tinted globes even the grey december light streaming in through the two windows could not make the apartment look anything but clean and delicate and dainty and delightful it was an ideal nest for a young couple but this one had outlived the honeymoon and cared very little for the ideal a very pretty room said jim again and you're the prettiest thing in it leah she looked at him scornfully and then glanced around i hate all this frippery she said contemptuously something more massive would suit me better well you are a kind of cleopatra you know if jim's historical knowledge had been more accurate he would have made a better comparison cleopatra according to the latest discoveries was small foxy-haired and dainty she would have suited this watteau-like room to perfection but lady jim was as tall as any daughter of the gods and bore herself after the imperial style of juno queen of olympus her hair was of a deep red and she had a great quantity as those who saw her pose in charity tableau knew very well leah possessed the creamy complexion which usually goes with such hair and a pair of large blue eyes out of which her soul had never peered they were hard eyes shallow as those of a bird and surveyed the world and its denizens with the inquiring expression of a cat on the lookout for titbits her lips were thin and covered admirably white and regular teeth it was a clever face and beautiful in its serene immobility 
those who did not like lady jim called her a cat but she was more like a sleek dangerous pantheress and woe to the victim who came under her claws yet she could purr very prettily on occasions well jim she said more graciously for she was sufficiently a woman to be pleased with her husband's grudging compliments now that you have finished saying sweet things what next this business we're on the jim if you say that again i'll leave you to get out of the trouble yourself you're my husband think of something i can't unless it's the insurance the insurance said leah thoughtfully twenty thousand pounds isn't it jim her husband nodded old jarvey peel my godfather had my life insured when i was a child and arranged that his heirs should pay up the money every year to keep it in force then there's accumulations of sorts i don't understand these stale things myself leah but i know that there's over twenty thousand can't you raise money on it no the old man arranged that i should lose it if i tried that game lord said jim with disgust if i could have raised money i should have got rid of it ages ago but how does it benefit you asked his wife curiously if the money is paid when you are dead you won't have any fun but i her eyes gleamed oh no you don't snapped jim not at all pleased at this hint you'd like to turn me into cash in that way i know but it so happens that the twenty thousand and whatever additions may have come will be paid to me when i'm sixty much fun in that when i shan't have teeth to crack nuts you're over thirty now jim thirty-five and you're only five years younger so when we get the cash at sixty there won't be any enjoyment left for either of us thirty-five from sixty murmured lady jim leaves how much jim twenty-five replied james after wrinkling his brow and communing with his none too quick brain beastly long time to wait leah nodded there's no chance of your getting it sooner not the slightest i can't get a cent on it and i can't sell it and i can't use it in any way jarvey peel was a silly old ass died worth no end of coin and didn't leave me a penny but if you die jim drop it retorted kames who did not at all relish the suggestion well but supposing you did insisted leah then i suppose the money would be paid to you said jim kicking the hearth rug with a gloomy face but don't you make any mistake leah i'm going to live right on to sixty and handle the money i can't do much at that age but i'll try hard to get through the lot before i slip off and what about me oh you must look after yourself said jim heartlessly but if you can think of some scheme to get the cash now i'll give you half there now there's nothing mean about me what's the use of talking rubbish said lady jim crossly you won't die not to oblige you my dear so don't think it then don't let us talk any more of the impossible is it impossible asked kames cunningly leah looked at him with wide bright eyes what is it she asked i might pretend to die you know said jim looking at her very directly then the cash should be paid to you and we could share but it's ridiculous cried leah raising her eyebrows you would have to give up your position and disappear who cares you know i never stop longer in england than i can help as to my position it's all debts and duns and squabbling with you oh i'd give up the whole thing for the money you never think of me got enough to do to think of myself grumbled kames sides you don't care for me as a widow you could have lots of fun on on say five thousand that's right jim take the lion's share to yourself well shouldn't i be paying the largest price for getting the cash leah shrugged her shoulders again there would be very little sacrifice in it so far as you are concerned she said you've been three times to south america since we were married and i presume with this money you would go there again i'd go out of your life for ever oh well she said coolly i could show my respect to your memory by wearing a widow's dress i expect i should look rather nice in a cap lord jim was rather disgusted little as he loved his wife he expected her to be devotedly attached to him and her ready acquiescence in his disappearance annoyed him greatly you've got no heart 
how clever of you to guess that i gave it to you five years ago and took it back before the honeymoon was over well you see jim you are so careless a man that i could not think of leaving the only heart i possess in your hands besides so many women have given you their hearts that i thought you might confuse the lot lord jim did not like this banter and said so in a few forcible words then he moved to the door casting a disgusted look at a pile of bills on leah's side of the table what about this truck oh we'll pay them out of your insurance laughed lady jim not much i'm not going to disappear and give up everything for the benefit of a lot of measly tradesmen i wish you wouldn't dangle grapes out of my reach said his wife pettishly you know it's not to be done jim plunged forward and gathering up the mass of papers threw them into the fire pay them in this way then said he enraged i wish i could sighed leah wearily and looked at herself in the mirror do stop worrying me jim i'm getting to look quite old are you going out yes we've wasted an hour in talking about nothing we're on the rocks i tell you and so said lady jim calmly you end where you began jim looked up to heaven and this is a wife said he plaintively and this she mocked laying her hand on his shoulder is a probable bankrupt not me i'll clear out first to south america leave the insurance money to me jim called leah as he banged the door twenty thousand pounds she soliloquized it's worth trying for but i might as well cry for the moon and she sighed the sigh of selfishness unexpectedly thwarted End of chapter 1chapter two of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter two lord and lady jim kames were regarded as a most agreeable couple and utilized this reputation to live on their friends the husband was an admirable shot a daring and judicious polo player and his skill at cards was as notable as his dexterity in golfing consequently he was much in request and benefited largely in free board and lodging he was good-looking which pleased the women and good-natured which satisfied the men in wrestling and boxing jim could more than hold his own and always paid his gambling debts even at the cost of allowing tradesmen to threaten legal proceedings thus according to modern ideas he was an honourable man and a good all-round sportsman a credit to the british aristocracy and a pleasure to his numerous friends these be thy gods o israel a clergyman once preached on this text in jim's accidental hearing but jim did not know what he meant the wife was a general favourite with the men but women fought rather shy of her she thought too much of herself they said and dressed altogether too well and moreover never gave even the most bitter-tongued female a chance of talking scandal in connection with the honoured name to which jim had called her attention however feminine artfulness led one and all to conceal this dislike and lady jim received as much kissing and as many sweet words and invitations as her vain hungry soul desired she saw through the wiles of her own sex clearly and knew that in nine cases out of ten the woman who kissed would have preferred to bite but they knew that lady jim knew and lady jim knew that they knew she knew so everything went well as to what was said behind her back lady jim cared not a snap of her fingers and if any rival dared to attack her openly she was quite able to use a particularly venomous tongue 
the safeguard against calumny which nature had given her and it must be said that she never went out of her way to harm any one her position was that of a passive resister as she pathetically observed she was a contented woman if only permitted to have her own way certainly the women had cause to complain of lady jim's gowns which were far beyond the ordinary female intellect in cut and fashion in new material and up-to-date trimmings she added her own ingenuity and taste to the creations of the dressmaker and the result was always such a triumph as to lead the rest of her sex to doubt if providence existed it would have been even more aggravating than it was had it been known that lady jim paid next to nothing for her gowns and advertised the dressmaker instead of settling the bill but leah did not make this fact public she was content to use her magnificent figure and good looks and her popularity in society to save a lean purse and therefore was daily and nightly clad in the purple and fine linen which wrung envious tears from other women's eyes sometimes lady jim fascinating a society paper editor would utilize his columns and circulation to advertise deserving tradesmen while from these in return she exacted tangible gratitude in the welcome shape of gloves handkerchiefs scents and similar needful if expensive commodities lady jim never signed her name to these literary efforts but they drew custom to the shop and filled her wardrobe with what she wanted at the moment so she was not ambitious to be known as an authoress even jim never knew how his wife as he put it contrived to tip-top and privately thought that the age of miracles was not yet past when leah could make something out of nothing for five years more or less lady jim had been clothed as the lilies of the field and had been supplied with nutriment by the lineal descendants of elijah's ravens but now things were coming to a crisis the long lane down which she had marched as solomon in all his glory was about to take a turning and lady jim did not relish the new route it led to second-rate lodgings at home or abroad to the lack of frocks and a diminution of other women's envy to the loss of a thousand and one luxuries which had become necessaries and to a self-denying ordinance of which she did not approve something must be done to prevent the necessity of turning down this penurious alley but when lady jim set out on her shopping excursion she did not very well see how she could avoid the almost inevitable needless to say leah had a trifle more in her purse than the one sovereign she had admitted the existence of to jim to be precise she possessed ten pounds and that had to last a week as pocket money she felt very hard up as she stepped into her motor-car and whirled down the street had she possessed the lamp of aladdin she would have made its slave bankrupt and to think that seven days of desiring pretty things should be supported on ten pounds the beggar at the gate of dives could not have been poorer but there was no sign of penury on the surface the unpaid sables lady jim wore were the best that the animal could give the fur rug over her feet had cost enough to keep a poor family for six months in food and fire though she or rather jim was being dunned for the payment of that the motor-car was one of the best and newest and lady jim drove it with the reckless speed of a woman who thinks the world was created so that she should play juggernaut having plenty of courage and a love for playing with death leah was a daring and skilful driver 
before now she had swept round a corner with two wheels beating the air but she had not as yet crushed any one under the said wheels and she ascribed this luck to her peacock's feather like all who have small belief in the deity lady jim was superstitious in a small way her fetish was a peacock's feather and so long as she had one about her nothing so she averred could possibly go wrong there was one now thrust into the left-hand lamp of the car and the panels were painted with the same feathers until they resembled the tail of juno's favourite bird lady jim might forget to go to church or to say her prayers or to thank god but she never forgot the necessary peacock's feather which was to ensure prosperity and safety she was reported to make genuflections before a shrine of this sort but the report was probably exaggerated no one knew what kind of a bale she worshipped but it is ridiculous to say that she did not adore at least one for she was in her way a very religious woman lady jim raced her car out of curzon street down park lane and into piccadilly where she amused herself with dodging nervous people and shaving the wheels of vehicles drawn by humble quadrupeds the chauffeur sat grimly silent expecting an almost certain spill with the calm of a fatalist he knew it would come some day in spite of his mistress's skilful driving but he neither worried nor remonstrated he was paid for a silent tongue and healthy nerves and if his life was insured rather heavily considering his profession that was no one's business but his wife's and she had already decided how to spend the insurance money but the woman need not have been so sure of such good fortune lady jim did not mind hurting other people but she had an uncommonly good notion of how to preserve the only neck she possessed when the car reached bond street lady jim who was as calm as though she had finished a donkey ride stepped down and entered a jeweller's shop lately she had paid a trifle off his bill and thought herself entitled to double the gross amount the jeweller knowing the duke of pentland had fifty thousand a year and that lady jim was too pretty a daughter-in-law not to get her own way with so gay an old nobleman did not object to his customer's purchases if lady jim could not pay the duke would so she was permitted to take away several objects for which she had no use then she went to select some new hats and look at the latest thing in frocks a call at certain other establishments resulted in the car being heaped with expensive trifles for christmas presents afterwards the car whirled into oxford street returned to piccadilly and stopped every now and then like a bird of prey at some shops she was received with sickly smiles at others which she favoured for the first time with her custom with rejoicing grins but out of every place lady jim walked calmly with a shopman in the rear bringing parcels to increase the baggage on the car she achieved the whole afternoon's work without once opening her purse could rothschild have financed things better at five o'clock with lighted lamps and unabated speed lady jim drove her machine to berkeley square and leaving the chauffeur to choke and shiver in the damp fog walked into a dull-looking house to see her godmother lady canvey she wished to ask the advice of that kindly shrewd old pagan and was not at all pleased when she found the rev lionel kames trying to lead lady canvey in the right way he had been trying to guide her heavenward for the last year but the bright-eyed old dame still danced along the primrose path with nimble feet and an appreciation of the agreeable people who were dancing along with her to perdition 
well my dear said lady canvey submitting her withered cheek to a conventional kiss lionel here has been speaking of the devil and you appear there's some truth in proverbs it seems oh lady canvey sighed a soft voice at the old pagan's elbow i forgot leah this is my philip you are but mortal companion you have not met her before and i don't think you'll seek her company again she's not quite your sort my dear not quite your sort joan come and show yourself in response to this order a slim tall girl with a serious face came forward shyly and put out a timid hand she was plainly dressed in a black stuff gown without colour or ornament her hands and feet were slim and small she had wavy brown hair twisted into a loose knot at the nape of her neck and the features of her somewhat pale face were delicately shaped on the whole an uncommonly pretty girl lady jim decided after taking in all this at a glance but less seriousness and brighter smiles would improve her looks she was like pygmalion's statue before the goddess had flushed its cold whiteness with rosy blood how are you asked leah nodding in a friendly way but without shaking hands you are one of lady canby's discoveries i suppose my discovery put in lionel cheerfully and with a proud glance at the white rose beauty of the girl lady canvey wanted a companion and i brought her one of fra angelico's saints finished lady jim who was honest enough to confess inwardly that this ethereal loveliness was most attractive quite so chuckled lady canvey arranging many costly rings on a pair of knuckly hands lionel knows how i enjoy the company of a saint you must put up with a sinner for the time being said lady jim good-humouredly i have come to talk business that means you intend to worry me grumbled lady canvey with a sharp glance from under her bushy eyebrows i hate being worried and bored oh i shan't bore you yes you will other people's affairs always bore me i am not like his reverence here and she waved her ebony cane towards the young curate who laughed cheerfully i admit there is some lack of resemblance assented lady jim dryly then she looked from the young man to the old woman lionel was her husband's cousin and should death make a clean sweep of the duke and frith and jim he would inherit the title and the fifty thousand a year which lady jim coveted this possibility which it must be admitted was sufficiently remote did not make leah love the young man any the more besides he was what she called goody-goody which meant that he had entered the service of his master for use and not for show as the curate of an exacting vicar in a lambeth parish he grubbed amongst the dirty poor and dispensed soup soap shelter and salvation rarely did lionel come to the west end as his task lay amongst the poor and lowly but when he did venture into high places he always called on lady canvey who had an odd kind of affection for him he's misguided but genuine my love said the pagan and moreover he amuses me which last statement amply accounted for the favour with which the old lady regarded him lionel was rather like jim tall and muscular and handsome but his face had an intelligent look which leah had never beheld in the dull visage of her husband and his blue eyes had the bright calm gaze of one whose faith is certain he affected the usual clerical garb but being only twenty-five and boyish at that his face wore a genial cheerful unworried expression which made most people open their hearts like a doctor a clergyman must have a good bedside manner and this lionel possessed moreover his heart was kindly and he was quick to observe the snubbed and neglected this 
feeling drew him towards joan who had retreated colouring painfully when lady jim substituted a nod for a handshake the girl was busy with a silver teapot egg-shell china and hot cakes and presently handed a cup to the visitor lady jim took it somewhat absently and having satisfied herself with lionel's looks and personality turned her eyes on lady canvey outwardly the old dame resembled the godmother of a fairy story and would have been admirably suited to the pointed cap and scarlet cloak of a professed witch yet the remains of beauty lingered about her wrinkled face recalling exciting crimean days when she had been a belle she was small and shrunken and bent and sometimes her grey head shook with palsy but her spirit was still vigorous and her brain clear as could be seen by the steadiness of her piercing black eyes diamond bright and clear she wore a lace cap a dress of silvery grey satin and many jewels costly but old-fashioned add to these a white china crape shawl and an ebony cane and behold the portrait of the lady known as the cleverest old harridan in town but that description was given by an enemy lady canby had a quick brain and a sharp tongue yet her heart was as kindly as that of lionel perhaps it was this which drew the young and old together the room was comfortable and luxuriously furnished but with the ugly taste of the early victorian epoch lady canvey now over eighty clung to the decorations and colours which had been fashionable when she was young and on stepping into the room lady jim felt as though she had slipped back to the time of the great exhibition the motor-car outside and the old lady in the red velvet armchair represented widely severed errors and even joan the saint and lionel the curate seemed alien to the world lady jim inhabited for that world closely resembled the one noah had fled from into the ark when the denizens were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage though to be sure marriage nowadays save as a visible sign of respectability was not much considered well godmother said lady jim thinking to curry favour with this she croesus by using an approved if somewhat obsolete address you are looking well then i'm a living lie retorted lady canby grimly how can you expect me to look well when lionel here has been quoting texts for want of originality i wanted you to hear the scripture protested lionel that's your business replied lady canby stirring her tea but i can hear the scriptures read when i please by joan who has a much sweeter voice than you young man as i suppose you think and she gave one of her dry chuckles the curate reddened and joan looked confused lady jim glancing from one serious face to the other drew her own conclusions and murmured something about a sealed fountain lady canvey not being versed in biblical imagery did not understand but lionel comprehended on the instant i am glad to hear that you read your bible lady james he said quickly leah hated to be addressed in this stiff manner yet it seemed appropriate to the out-of-date room but she had no desire to quarrel with her godmother's pet in the presence of that opulent lady so she turned the tables on lionel by looking shocked of course i do i am not a pagan then i must be one snapped lady canby for i wouldn't be you leah kames for the heaven i don't expect to go to hush hush said lionel pained by this flippancy coming from those withered lips lady jim glanced at her opulent beauty in a dim mirror framed in tarnished gold and laughed softly her godmother saw the look and was swift to interpret its meaning i was like that once she said in rather a quavering voice and you'll come to be such as i am only you'll never wear so well oh what an 
arm i had and she began to weep silently over her lost beauty while lionel and joan comforted the poor soul leah looked sympathetic but gave no assistance she decided that lady canvey was in her dotage and would be the more easily dealt with on that account her one desire therefore was to get rid of the two unnecessary people and begin operations at once she hoped by skilful management to come away with a considerable check in lady canvey's shaky handwriting those drivelling tears meant a weak will and that to one of leah's determination meant money about this business she began when the old woman was again her cheerful cynical self could you spare me ten minutes godmother certainly my dear it's all i can spare you this was not a promising beginning but lady jim knew she would not walk off with the spoils without a sharp brush for their gaining she looked at lionel and then at the girl whom she was sure in her own heart the curate loved have you ever heard mr kames talk chinese metaphysics miss tallentire she asked joan having possessed herself of the companion's surname no said joan opening her violet eyes widely i am not clever enough to understand ask mr kames if he doesn't think you are clever enough really lady james lionel interrupted lady canvey sharply go into the conservatory with joan she will show you a new dwarf oak which i lately bought leah will entertain me and i'm pretty sure chuckled she that i shall entertain leah she's going to be nasty thought lady jim with a charming smile and continued to smile until the curate and his unsuspecting companion went to see the dwarf oak and to talk chinese metaphysics which leah was certain they would do lionel with a defiant glance at his cousin and with a colour which made him look unexpectedly handsome followed joan out of the stuffy room when the door was closed and the fire was unnecessarily poked up and lady canvey was comfortably settled in her chair after a word or two about the draughts which no one but herself could feel in that close atmosphere lady jim waited patiently for her godmother to begin the battle she had not long to wait lady canvey's eyes were bright and lady canvey's spirit reared like a war-horse to plunge down on leah she sniffed once or twice and looked sharply at the beautiful smiling face then she delivered herself of a speech which put lady jim's late behaviour in a nutshell leah said lady canvey you're a born cat End of chapter 2「3 of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter three lady jim was not at all offended she made every allowance for the querulous temper of old age and still smiled i rather like cats myself she observed casually they know what they want but they don't always get it my dear snapped lady canvey adding inconsequently when the cat's in the dairy she's after the cream i don't think that's an original remark said leah languidly and loosening her furs for the room really was heated like the conservatory in which the lovers talked chinese metaphysics didn't george eliot say something of the sort i never knew him retorted lady canvey wilfully dense you and your chinese metaphysics indeed i won't have it 
have them corrected leah gently and unable to resist the opportunity lady canvey scowled like the fairy carabus and continued without heeding the impertinence joan is the daughter of lionel's vicar i see and he intends to be the vicar's son-in-law what is that to you news expressed lady jim serenely i never knew such a prig as lionel could fall in love his love is the love of an honest man declared the old dame striking her crutch on the carpet i hope so for the sake of his cloth chinese metaphysics indeed grumbled lady canvey the poor child did not know what you meant she certainly seems to be somewhat dull dull yourself leah she's a sweet-tempered good thoughtful girl oh i didn't mean to say she was so dull as all those qualities imply said lady jim sweetly lady canvey looked wrathfully round for something to throw at her visitor's head but the tea-table was too far away and the old woman prized her cups and saucers finally she took refuge in a spiteful speech she's an honest girl i sincerely hope so seeing she is your companion replied leah not caring to take up so ridiculous a challenge when did you start her leah lady canvey thumped the ground again don't talk slang if you wish to know although i don't think it is any of your business joan tallentire came to me two months ago during which time you have not come to see me i was abroad apologized lady jim stifling a yawn gambling at monte carlo i'll be bound i did meet jim there he lost heavily on the red i won and came home with enough to see me through the last month who were you living on abroad asked the old woman contemptuously lady jim leaned back and placed her muff chain between two very red lips let me think she murmured not put out in the least oh that little dowdy australian woman who is trying to get into society on her husband's money asked me to stop at their villa and you did for four weeks and borrowed money i'll be bound lady jim nodded blandly you can't expect me to live with pigs for nothing she said with the greatest coolness you'd live with the devil and borrow from him i believe cried the exasperated lady canvey glaring i do live with one assented her goddaughter but he's a stony broke devil more modern flowers of speech i didn't create the language you can help using it no people wouldn't understand if i talked like lady jane grey or elizabeth fry they were good women but so dull objected lady jim why is it good women are always dull and dowdy they are getting ready for the next world mumbled lady canvey solemnly their outfit can't cost much then declared leah flippantly but aren't we going to talk business think of that poor french sitting in the motor-car all this time you're sorry for him i'm sure said the old woman ironically horribly replied lady jim calmly but at least the poor creature is cooler than i am this room is stifling don't call your fellow sinner a creature leah ah even had i not seen lionel i could guess he had been with you godmother he loves the dirty and disreputable and you love the rich and disreputable that obvious speech is hardly worthy of your reputation was lady jim's reply then she crossed her legs rested her muff on her knee and protested i can't wait here much longer on account of french no but i'm going to dine at the cecil to-night with a boy in the lancers he's a nice boy and a rich boy of course i don't like boys without money but this business she went on hurriedly jim and i are in a hole you ought to be in jail was the angry reply 
that would be a hole said leah good-humouredly but you don't want to see jim and me in the bankruptcy court why should i bother it's nothing to do with me i'm your goddaughter you're a heartless cat said lady canby angrily and with her eyes scintillating like jewels it's no use leah i've helped you and that rascal jim over and over again apply to the duke oh we've done that he won't give us a penny then ask some of those nice boys you talk of lady jim sat very upright in her chair and a becoming colour heightened her beauty i don't ask any men for money she declared you know perfectly well lady canvey that i am any honest woman and how dull that sounds chuckled lady canvey turning the tables you should be more original leah i don't mind going out to dinner with a man cried lady jim feeling herself much aggrieved nor do i mind a box at the theatre or some gloves or things of that sort so long as jim doesn't object pooh much you care for jim i do jim's got a temper he told me this very morning he'd screw my neck if i broke loose then i respect him for saying it said lady canvey energetically and i'd respect him still more if he did it that's what i said to him retorted leah grimly all the same i am straight enough no one can say a word against me i'm glad to hear it you have your good points leah observed lady canvey in a more kindly tone but you show your worst side to the world why not turn over a new leaf i'm just about to do so and there's bankruptcy on the other side unless you help us dear godmother she ended coaxingly i won't was the firm response it's like pouring water into a sieve i've given you and jim at least five thousand pounds where is it i ask where we must pay our bills you ought to but you don't money will go in ways it shouldn't go snapped the old woman feeling herself mistress of the situation don't talk nonsense to me leah you and that rascal are a couple of spendthrifts the duke bless him started you both with a good home and a good income and now now we're on the rocks as jim cleverly puts it said leah who could not help seeing the humour of the dilemma you didn't think jim was so original did you godmother leah you're impossible i'm sure i don't know why you should say that remonstrated lady jim i must keep up my position it's not as if you had been expensively brought up went on lady canvey unheeding your father was a wasteful pauper for he got precious little off that estate of his in buckinghamshire and what he did get went into his own pocket said lady jim supplementing the family history but as my mother was dead and i was his only daughter he might have treated me better geoffrey wayne was like yourself leah a hard-hearted selfish oh spare me these adjectives interrupted lady jim rising my father is dead so there's nothing more to say if you can't help me at least you needn't call me names i beg your pardon said lady canvey very politely as i don't intend to give you a shilling i have no right to tell you what i think of your doings will you ring the bell please i want joan when lady canvey took this tone leah knew well that the case was hopeless in spite of senile weeping it appeared that the old woman was not so easily beguiled as might have been expected there seemed nothing for it but to leave in silence but remembering how desperate was the position lady jim refrained from ringing the bell and made a last appeal this time on business grounds if you will give me a thousand pounds for six months she proposed my husband and i will pay it back with interest and the security my dear our joint names said leah with dignity ring the bell was all the answer that lady canvey vouchsafed to this proposal and good-night my dear 
lady jim recognized that she was beaten and nothing remained but to retire with dignity pressing the button of the bell she crossed to lady canvey and kissed her withered cheek with a caressing smile i am so pleased to see you looking so well she said gently but i see signs of failing in your conversation you won't see any signs of lending was the grim response oh here you are joan as that young lady entered the room with lionel at her heels send these people away and read me a chapter out of that new novel which came yesterday good-night said lionel bending over the old lady and kissing her hand with the tenderness of a son she twitched it away there there good-night take leah to that miserable creature who is perishing in her motor-car and don't make love to her she is one of those women who are a crown to their husbands lady jim did not wait to hear the old woman's chuckle as she fired this last shot but swept out of the room smiling kindly on miss tallentire the curate followed her and leah began to consider what use she could make of him to farther her plans let me drive you to lambeth she said while arranging her sables at the door lionel laughed lambeth would be shocked to see me arrive at my lodgings in such an up-to-date style said he pulling up the collar of his coat no thank you lady james i'll walk for a time and then take a westminster bridge bus no you won't she contradicted in an imperious tone i wish to talk to you come get in french you can go home but the car my lady i'll look to that do as you're told looking rather apprehensively at the machine which was humming and shaking in the bitter cold french touched his cap and moved away leah stepped lightly in and beckoned to lionel with one hand while she gripped the steering-wheel with the other come along the curate did not display much eagerness to come is it safe he asked you've sent the man away because i want to talk privately with you safe she echoed in a tone of impatient scorn i'd drive a car against edge himself oh very well said kames carelessly and placed himself beside her he was utterly devoid of fear and if there was to be a smash he was not unprepared to enter the next world lady jim gave the wheel a twirl and the car glided through the square under the grey muffling of the fog reckless as she was lady jim had to steer carefully and move slowly lest she should run into something for the fog was a trifle thicker than it had been during the afternoon all the same her keen eyes could see clearly enough and she was not at all afraid cool under all circumstances lady jim would have hummed a ditty on the streaming bridge of a plunging bucking tramp steamer going down in the bitter north atlantic weather lionel marvelled at her composure and wondered if even her dear intellect could grasp the meaning of death and its hereafter but lady jim was thinking of this world rather than of the next and talked of her troubles while steering the car down piccadilly jim and i are in a hole about money she announced abruptly for there was no need to be diplomatic with this simpleton that is not unusual murmured lionel she laughed and nodded no we have both a wonderful capacity for getting through cash now we've got down to what an american girl called the bed rock and we want help i never knew you when you did not want help said the curate wondering what was best to say and in some ways your want is very dire don't preach lionel money is better than sermons to such as you and jim no doubt but setting aside the spiritual need a sermon on your extravagance would do you good i'm afraid not rejoined lady jim putting on the brake for the st james's street incline it would only go in at one ear and out of the other when i want sermons i'll come and hear you preach in that dirty little church of yours meantime you must help to get jim and me out of this scrape 
lionel was annoyed by her reference to his church but from experience he knew it was worse than useless to argue with lady jim i cannot help you he said stiffly you know my small means bless the man i don't mean you to put your hand in your pocket i am quite aware that the clergy are better at asking than at giving you have no right to say that remonstrated kames warmly we help the poor and needy in that case you have now a chance of practising what you preach lady jim negotiated cockspur street and felt her way along trafalgar square in the hope of hitting whitehall only when the car was buzzing down that thoroughfare did lionel speak i am sitting in a most expensive machine he said indignantly swathed in a costly rug and beside a woman with a fortune on her back in the way of clothes then you ought to be very happy said leah calmly but i'll drop you at lambeth soon and then you can get back to the mud and rags which you seem to prefer my meaning is that if you were poor you could not afford these luxuries nonsense it is only poor people who can afford them the rich make their money by self-denial and wearing clothes which don't fit in houses furnished with the riff-raff of auction-rooms jim and i have been brought up to better things to better worldly things corrected lionel bitterly and very pleasant they are my dear man it is people such as you and your husband who make the poor discontented insisted the curate i am sure i don't see why the poor should be murmured lady jim vaguely there are lots of shelters and soup kitchens and workhouses and i always put ten shillings into the plate on hospital sunday not to speak of the way in which i've danced and sung at performances got up to help people who don't need the money so much as i do nero fiddling while rome burned well and what else could the poor man have done retorted leah there were no fire brigades in those days were there lionel felt helpless you don't understand oh yes i do you mean to be nasty if i were a vindictive woman i would drop you into the river car and all they were crossing westminster bridge by this time but i always like to be nice being nasty brings wrinkles and makes one so old but about our trouble she went on determined to have her own way lady canvey won't help us and no one else either there's the duke he has done enough for you not at all lady jim assured him coolly he's kept us on bread and water that's all oh lionel was shocked at this ungrateful speech and you prefer pate de foie gras and champagne naturally not that i like pate de foie gras they torture the geese to get it i believe and it seems cruel to eat it you have a tender heart said kames sarcastically it has been my ruin but this trouble she harked back again to the one subject which occupied her thoughts will you see the duke and ask him to give us say er uh, er uh, well two thousand pounds no i won't you'll only waste it that's so like you parsons said lady jim snappishly we ask for bread and you give us a stone two thousand pounds worth of bread is a trifle too much to ask for not at all i always ask for twice what i hope to get but here we are on the other side of the water i can't take the machine into your dirty little slums get down lionel did so and stepped on to the pavement thank you for the drive said he lifting his soft hat lady jim nodded vaguely won't you speak to the duke kames hesitated he did not wish to appear churlish yet it seemed useless to interfere the duke is very independent he explained i don't think he'll listen to me oh yes he will you're a parson and he is old enough to be afraid of the next world tell him we're cleaned out and get jim and me a thousand and i tell you what added leah generously if you do i'll give you a ten-pound note for your charities though i don't believe in helping paupers myself yet you ask help on that ground 
oh i mean the unwashed paupers you're so fond of lionel ruminated do you and jim go down to firmingham for christmas yes it will be horribly dull the duke is so fond of that old-fashioned dickens christmas with his holly and mistletoe rubbish but we must keep in with him what of it why not explain your position and oh we've explained it a dozen times but the duke doesn't seem to understand now you can put the thing to him nicely well said the curate slowly i go to firmingham at christmas to preach so i'll speak to the duke you're a brick cried lady jim holding out her hand i'll come and hear you preach when we're in firmingham i hope it will do you good said lionel shaking hands you think me a prig lady james but i assure you i know you do said leah dreading further sermons but i must get home to dress good night good night echoed lionel hopelessly and saw the car glide away into the fog between the lines of blurred lights poor woman he thought turning towards his lodgings how terribly sad her spiritual position is i trust she will get home safely seeing she is so worldly he need not have troubled lady jim reached curzon street in safety and in very good spirits did not a peacock's feather adorn one of the motor-car lamps end of chapter three chapter four of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter four firmingham was the smallest of the duke of pentland's country seats and so cosy that he invariably held his christmas revels there in preference to dispensing yule-tide hospitality in more splendid mansions situated in a woody and elevated part of essex that county presumed to be a fog-tormented puddle the quaint georgian house was ideal in itself and in the repose and charm of its surroundings ugly it probably was when erected but time had mellowed its glaring walls of red brick and nature had draped them with hangings of dark green ivy the square lofty house with its freestone ornamentation its many windows and gigantic porch stood on a slight rise a position which enhanced its noble proportions on three sides level with the ground floor extended broad grey stone terraces with shallow steps leading downward to smooth lawns these stretching for a considerable distance terminated in flower-beds now devoid of blossom and colour and lawns house and flower-gardens were girdled by pines and oaks sycamore trees and elms with noble examples of the birch the beech and cedars proud and tall a wide straight avenue ran for a quarter of a mile through grim firs to ornate iron gates swinging between massive stone pillars surmounted by the ducal arms and these same gates gave entrance to a spacious and wild park as delightful as that wood near athens where oberon tricked titania the charming country outside this sacred enclosure appealed to artists in search of the picturesque certainly the landscape was domestic and tame for here nature yielded to the controlling hand of man but the pleasant walks the deep lanes the ancient villages and the comfortable farmhouses sprinkled thickly for miles made in conjunction a pretty picture of rural peace and contentment and the contentment was genuine for no better or more considerate landlord than the duke existed he was popular in the neighbourhood and his sway almost imperial a true king of the castle jim and his wife drove from the station in quite a darby and joan style and through fear of the duke rather than in compliment to the season 
were prepared to enact the parts of man and wife to perfection it was rather hard for leah to say pretty things to jim in public and for jim to hover anxiously round leah as a lover-like husband but the duke expected such behaviour and they were astute enough not to disappoint him in his rough tweeds with jovial looks and hearty words jim was quite the english squire of the story-book and shook hands with some of his father's tenants who haunted the local station in quite the all men are brothers style leah also dispensed smiles and nods to marvelling villagers who stared open-mouthed at her beauty but in the comfortable broom jim folded his arms and lapsed into sulky silence and leah yawned and looked out of the window for want of something better to do they were off the stage now and could take their ease very wintry looked the landscape through which they passed the meadowlands were deep in snow and gaunt leafless trees started like black spectres from the milky ground ponds and ditches wore masks of darkly green ice and the frozen road rang like iron under the hoofs of the horses a yellowish sky with the promise of almost immediate snow lowered over the starving world and for lack of foliage the landscape widened to the observing eye a dull crimson in the west showed that the sun was sinking in foggy splendour the shrill voices of children singing music-hall songs instead of carols saluted their ears quite like a christmas card isn't it jim if it wasn't for the music-hall songs assented her husband looking out of his window wonder if they'll be skatin i dare say i hope so i love skating cause you can show off we have each our little vanities jim said lady jim whom hope made good-humoured there's the church what a pretty old building and how well the snow contrasts with the red roof and the ivy we have to go there on christmas day gloomed kames we must show an example to the lower orders explained leah in her british matron tone besides lionel preaches how awful why has the duke put him in the bill mr dane the vicar is ill and asked lionel to fill the pulpit the duke has nothing to do with it wish i had grumbled jim i'd have the sermon cut out you'd have the church turned into a music-hall i dare say retorted his wife contemptuously but you must be as nice as you know how to lionel remember he promised to speak to the duke i'll keep awake during his sermon but i shan't promise to do more leah you're running this show quite so but i don't want you to spoil it lionel has great influence with the duke frightens the old man to death with texts and Tophet, i expect said jim crossly i know these parsons i was not aware that your circle of friends included such respectable acquaintances oh i can hold a candle to a certain person as well as you leah who do we meet at firmingham the usual dull lot said lady jim with a yawn frith and his stupid little wife who seems to model herself on david copperfield's dora then lady canvey with her new companion is sure to be present fancy having that death's head at a christmas feast who else leah that little russian dr demetrius we met him at the embassy if you remember not the russian embassy but the french he's out of favour with the czar and dare not leave england in case he should be sent to siberia he can practise for it here said jim shivering beastly cold isn't it leah what's demetrius doin here looking after the duke's health he says he can cure his gout i hope he will muttered kames devoutly for if frith comes along we shan't get a shillin i'm half afraid we shan't get one now sighed lady jim here's the avenue what a charming place i'd let it out on building leases if i had it remarked the prosaic jim and cut the timber lots of money in those trees don't look into jewellers windows jim you're not rich enough to buy the stock rich it was as much as i could do to scrape enough together for our tickets ah well said leah reassuringly as the wheels scrunched the frozen snow before the grey porch we needn't spend anything here except half a crown for the plate 
catch me wasting money in that way snapped kames swinging himself out to help his wife to alight hello here's old collie looking like a dean as usual and jim again assuming his hearty manner and jovial leer shook hands with the butler whom he had known since etonian days the house party was composed of hostile elements consequently every one was compelled to adopt a forced air of christmas peace and good-will which rather tried jumpy nerves the duke dug up fossilized cousins to participate in the festive season and these did not suit with some fashionable folk who for various reasons as they put it had to be nice to the dear old duke mr jaffrey and his poetic sister of fifty who quarrelled incessantly hardly suited the tastes of mrs penworthy as a daughter of the horse leech and intensely up-to-date nor did graham the little england politician enjoy the company of lord sargon a tory and a believer in the divine right of the last legal descendant of the stuarts also the various young women and men who were really nobodies and fancied in themselves somebodies found the parts they were expected to take in an old-fashioned christmas rather a bore the season of peace and good-will explained the duke after dinner when this collection of smartness and do wellness embellished the great drawing-room we must all love one another the company assented conventionally and every one smiled violently on every one to the amusement of lady canby if this was the palace of truth she announced there would be trouble but the mellowing influence of the time just so duke but some people are like certain pears they won't mellow they only become sleepy and that reminds me she added looking round for joan i'll go to bed soon not on christmas eve urged the duke bending over her chair we intend to keep yule-tide as our ancestors did snapdragon the mummers the christmas tree the carol singers and the ghost stories not one of them clever enough to tell a real ghost story snapped lady canby cynically examining faces old and young made up and natural oh i know a lovely lovely tale said miss jaffrey who was gowned girlishly in white trimmed oddly with ivy and who looked like a ruin that will last till to-morrow morning chimed in her brother seeing an opportunity of being nasty snapdragon is more fun eh letty frith you used to enjoy that once i do so now dear snapdragon said the marchioness who was sentimental and adored her tall lean husband but the christmas tree oh that is too sweet bunny and i met for the first time under a christmas tree and he fell in love with me didn't you bunny it was rather hard on lord frith that he should be addressed by this most inappropriate name he was as stiff as a spaniard sad in his looks and spoke little although eminently well-bred and clever in a political way he was not a genial personage in this he differed from his father for the duke was stout and kindly-looking beaming with good humour and quite the style of host who would have figured in sir roger de coverley's time report said that he had been much too gay in his youth and that the late duchess had put up with a great deal lady canvey could have related stories about the duke likely to be much more entertaining than the proposed ghost tales but she was fond of her host who like herself was a link with the remote past and never told stories out of school when she and the duke got together they wagged their old heads over dead and done with scandals and lamented these days of vulgar and blatant sin but whatever their pasts may have been they were an ideal couple in the way of venerable looks and sweet old age quite a philemon and baucus of modern times meantime bunny scowled on his frivolous little wife and then gave her a sentimental smile he was always torn between love and propriety for lady frith imitating dora as lady jim averred said the most exasperating things in a sweet treble he used to lecture her in private and explain what she should say but these corrections always ended in tears on the part of the child wife and in complete surrender on the part of her doting husband lady frith certainly could play her part in society excellently well on occasions and was more shrewd than would have been guessed from her baby face and infantile manners 
but she wanted to be original and therefore plagiarized from dickens's novel this assumption of an imaginary character she called possessing a personality mrs penworthy was old wine in a new bottle that is she looked twenty-five and acted like an experienced coquette of double the age married to a modern job called freddy whose meekness was proverbial she led him about like a pet lamb and taught him a few parlour tricks so that people might say what an attached couple which they did tongue-in-cheek a sweet look from mrs penworthy warmed freddy's heart for four-and-twenty hours even though the cost of the merest glance sometimes ran into double figures in his hours of leisure which were few he frequently told her that she was an angel but the expression did not sound so agreeable on freddy's lips as on those of the half-dozen nice boys who constituted her court she went everywhere and knew every one and did the things she ought not to have done with discretion freddy thought her a playful kitten quite blind to the fact that she had grown rapidly into a cat but with smiling looks and sheathed claws and freddy's diamonds on her neck she was a very pretty cat and blinked sleepily at those who admired her so long as freddy gave her a silken cushion to rest on and plenty of cream to drink moreover she only scratched those who could not scratch back i really think it's awful fun said mrs penworthy to her court all this sort of thing you know holly and snow and and mistletoe suggested one of the nice boys now if you talk like that algy you shan't be spoken to for a week a look is enough for me whispered the adoring algy naughty what would freddy say lady canvey's sharp ears overheard the banter were i freddy i know what i'd say she murmured grimly then aloud to spoil sport is your husband here mrs penworthy freddy oh dear me no he's gone to paris or peru or i forget exactly where but it's something beginning with a p dear freddy she laid an entirely useless fan on her lips pensively he works so very very hard and quite right too said lady canvey bluntly seeing what a devoted wife he has ah you don't know how freddy tries me dear lady canvey i am devoted that i am but you see i took freddy for better or worse oh no corrected the old woman tartly you took the better and freddy took the worse mrs penworthy not being ready with an answer murmured something about jealous old thing and moved away with her court to where lord sargon was holding forth on his pet craze if only our ancient kings were back he said but not too loud as the duke might have disapproved of the disloyalty christmas would be christmas in the good old times of the blessed martyr charles the bad old times contradicted mr graham it was then that our beloved country began to annex places which are useless let us give up everything beyond the channel and attend to our own country then indeed christmas will be christmas and the parish pump will pour forth beer said mr jaffrey referring to the badge of the little englander ah the conduits ran wine in those sweet old days sighed his sister in her poetic vein and people never washed said a truculent old gentleman given to sanitation what i say is let every house have a bathroom i say jim is this going to last for ever asked leah considerably bored by these intellectual fireworks a week anyhow replied jim who was feeling happy after a large dinner but if you will come to the zoo leah you mustn't find fault with the animals they are scarcely so interesting oh animals don't talk i suppose you mean you do retorted lady jim calmly there's demetrius and she left her husband in the clutches of mrs penworthy with a whispered caution don't let her go too far jim this week were the respectable middle-class pair who live in slate-roofed houses jim did not quite understand but he vaguely guessed that he was to keep mrs penworthy at a distance for some minutes he did this but she soon overcame his scruples and begged him to take her to the picture gallery the discreet court did not follow constantine demetrius was a small dark neat man with an ivory complexion black hair a waxed moustache and a stereotyped smile he was dressed perfectly in a foreign fashion and placed his small feet together when he made his bow to lady jim 
his english was much better than his morals and perhaps this was why lady jim beckoned him to her side demetrius was one of her most ardent admirers and she had a vague idea of making use of him at present she did not see how to utilize his services but if ever she required a thoroughly unscrupulous man she knew that she would need him besides he was really a clever doctor and when lady jim was ill she felt it would hasten the cure to think she was being attended to for nothing what do you think of all this she asked him when they were snugly bestowed in a cosy corner it is very english said the russian with a shrug that means very dull demetrius clicked his heels together and made a bow from the middle of his body at present i cannot say so said he gallantly and you wouldn't if you thought so madame the truth to a ravishing woman is like sunshine to a coal miner we get it so rarely by the way how is mademoiselle aksakoff she is well and as pretty as ever i see nothing of beauty but what is before me all the same you will leave me and marry mademoiselle aksakoff demetrius looked at lady jim with such fire in his dark eyes that she felt slightly uncomfortable in spite of her courageous nature it was easy to play with the hearts of phlegmatic englishmen but to amuse herself with this fiery slav was like trifling with a tiger nevertheless lady jim with a view to future contingencies allured him with sweet looks and tantalized him with half-granted favours katinka aksakoff the daughter of a russian official attached to the embassy loved demetrius even to the extent of helping him to escape the lures of the secret police which would have drawn him to the continent en route for siberia therefore she hated lady jim because that astute diplomatist kept demetrius dangling at her skirts in the bonds of a never-to-be-requited love on the chance that some day she might require him and the russian knew that leah kames was a woman who wanted all for nothing but if possible he intended to make his own bargain with her lady jim was clever but demetrius thought he could entangle her monsieur demetrius she said after a pause during which the fire died out of the russian's eyes if you wanted money i would get it said he determinedly but if you saw no way of getting it i would make the way you can't make bricks without straw clever people can replied demetrius dryly lady jim looked down at her rings are you clever she asked to benefit some people i might be he said in a low voice she stared straight before her and noted that lionel was chatting with miss tallentire as yet the curate had not spoken with the duke so that was a quarter yet to be tried nevertheless lady jim had a shrewd idea in spite of the comedy being played by herself and jim and of lionel's pleading that the duke would be adamant it behooved her to have another string to her bow and this she could find in demetrius but she did not know yet to what use she could put him it was impossible to ask him to sway the duke strong as his influence was with that gouty nobleman lady jim had a good deal of what she called pride and did not intend to let demetrius know her true position if she could help it before she could say anything and really she did not know what to say the duke gave the signal for the commencement of the christmas festivities these were strong in intention but weak in execution the company burnt their fingers over snapdragon capered in sir roger de coverley tempted the fates with roasting chestnuts and finally adjourned to a large hall where glittered a splendid christmas tree then danced in the mummers villagers all tricked out as robin hood and maid marian as a terrible turk santa claus st george and the dragon a most meek beast and with hordes of merry laughing children the christmas tree dropped its costly many-coloured fruits into expectant laps and a chorus of praise hymned the munificence of the gratified duke even lady jim thanked him for the dainty gold net purse which she received and if she did peep in slyly to see whether it was lined with a cheque or a bank-note that was only out of compliment to her father-in-law's known generosity santa claus has not got a banking account she murmured to her husband jim who was scowling at his gift a set of sleeve links enamelled with the four vices women cards drink and racing growled he's got a dashed lot of impertinence as if i'd wear these things no said leah tickled by the implied rebuke it doesn't do to wear your heart on your sleeve links a witticism which was entirely lost on jim 
he was one of the many obtuse swine who trampled on leah's pearls what with eating and drinking and professing seasonable sentiments which certainly did not come from the heart every one became bored and bilious and fractious leah surveyed the yawning revellers with a feeling that christmas old style was a failure you can't arrange an orgy was her comment to lady canvey it must come by chance to be successful i don't think pentland intended anything so disreputable retorted the old dame consequently you are disappointed bored lady jim assured her i suppose it's eating plum pudding which always makes me dull but not good nature my digestion has its limits good night godmother i suppose it's time for you to be taken to pieces and having stricken lady canvey dumb with rage she slipped away to bed wondering what would happen before next christmas something must be done she thought wearily climbing the stairs if lionel fails with the duke demetrius might might what she did not know but she really did feel that something might be done with demetrius End of chapter four